You didn't ask me about double standards that Muslims had when we talk about. Oh, I didn't come back to that. I'm helping okay. you out. All right. I helped you out with that one. <laughs> yeah, no, please do share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. we have no double standards, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, it. That's yeah, my yeah. answer, yeah. No, um... Welcome to our channel, where we make it our ambition to respect and learn from our neighbors, to equip the church, and share the message of Jesus until all hear. And if any of my jokes don't work again, <laughs> feel free. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Feel free. Yeah, just, if your jokes, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you bomb, that's okay. Yeah, I, I kind of just, we'll yeah, yeah, that. yeah. I do like a free flowing style, and then that allows you to, you know, say, okay, I'll cut that out or <laughs> sure. whatnot. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome to a another video on our channel here. Until all here, and today we're actually doing something a little different than what we've done so far. Is that we have a guest. We get to do an interview and our guest today is from the Islamic community. His name is Sadat Anwar and he also runs a YouTube channel called That Canadian Brother that will certainly be linked in the description. You can check out his videos there. So this is very exciting for us as you know at our channel we're about promoting interfaith dialogue and not just fluffy basic conversations like we agree on the same things. It's like we want to have substantial conversations around truth and we have decided to get a guest from a different faith whom we feel holds very similar values to us in terms of interfaith dialogue. And so I'm going to let my guest introduce himself, tell a little bit about himself, and then we'll start asking him some questions and we'll let the conversation go. So Sadat, thank you so much for being here. Thank Thanks you. a lot for having me, uh, both of you. I appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, my full name is Sadat Anwar. Um, I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm involved in this kind of thing, this kind of like interfaith or interfaith activism, whatever you'd like to call it. You, you know the term dawah, you know, yes. Muslim outreach. Yes. Um, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a formal uh, mm -hmm. student of Islam. I haven't gone through the seminary or anything like that. So that's an important disclaimer to make. Um, I'm, I'm not that Canadian sheikh or that Canadian <laughs> imam. Okay. I'm, I'm uh. that Canadian brother, right? I'm, you okay. know, I'm just your brother and trying to share uh, the basics of Islam with people. Um, I do uh, mosque tours at uh, Tariq Mosque, which is a mosque in, in North York in Toronto. So I'm, I'm often interacting with uh, Christians, Catholic Christians, different student groups coming from different schools, things like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great. No, it's, it's really cool that you're here. And um, I guess the... The first question that we can kind of toss your way, it can be sort of related to um, your introduction and who you are, is that we'd, we'd love to hear a little bit about your faith journey in terms of mm. born, in, born into Islam, your parents, or um, I'm sure like even in Christianity, there's a process that even if you're born into a Christian home, mm -hmm. there's still when you get to you know the age where you can make decisions for yourself, you still have to decide. So we'd like to hear a little bit about your, your faith journey. Yeah, um, I sometimes I kind of half jokingly say that I, I wish I had a more exciting testimonial okay. to share with people. <laughs> a lot know, of Christians say that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It'd be, uh, it'd be, I guess it'd be kind of exciting if I was able to say, well, you know, I'm a former gangster and uh, <laughs> got shot two times. I got these knife scars on my back. Then I went to jail and I was doing this, that, and then Islam, you know, just turned my life around. And <laughs> that would be exciting, but... Uh, no, but the truth is more bland, which is, uh, sure. as you said, yes, I was born into Islam in that my parents immigrated from Pakistan, okay. and Pakistan is you know, something like 97, 98% Muslim. Mm. So yeah, I was, I was born and raised as a Muslim. Um, yet at the same time, as you uh, alluded to it, um, you know, it's, it wasn't simply a matter of me just blindly adopting my parents' faith. Right. Um, I had to critically work it through because... Um, like, look, if you're born and raised in the secular West, uh, I don't think you can grow up and just uncritically, blindly adopt your parents' faith. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's very difficult. So even if I wasn't ready to critically examine my faith, what about all my non-Muslim friends right. in high school, in junior high? Aren't they going to at some point ask me, uh, Sadat, how come you can't eat pork? Right. It tastes good. <laughs> this is what I heard all the time right? <laughs> in junior school. Or Sadat, how, how, uh, how are you supposed to get married if you can't date? 
if you can't have a girlfriend, how are you going to meet anybody? How are you going to get married, right? Yeah. Uh, now, ironically, most of those non-Muslims probably aren't married. A lot of them are probably still on the dating circuit. Right. You know right. what I mean? Mm. Um, but uh, my point is that these kinds of critical questions, you know, were always like thrown at me, and not in a bad way, like just genuine, sincere questions right. you would ask a friend. So. Um, now, had I been in a Muslim country, I wouldn't ha have to have thought critically about these questions. But here I had to think about it or I had to ask my parents or other Muslims. Uh, so from, uh, from a relatively young age, I had to kind of think about these things. Um, but yeah, the main uh, sources of kind of inspiration in my life uh, very quickly were uh, Sheikh Ahmad Didat, who we mentioned earlier on. Um, this was in the early 90s, watching his videotapes. There was a local uh, American-Canadian scholar who is still uh, active here. His name is Abdullah Hakim Quick. Okay. Um, then there was the 1992 Spike Lee film. You're, you're trying to see what the connections here are, right? But <laughs> in 1992, Spike Lee directed a film called Malcolm X okay. with Denzel Washington. That was a life-changing moment for me, gotcha. watching that, that film in the cinema. Um, and then, yeah, I met a good friend at University of Toronto and... And my wife has also been a good influence on me as well, too. And so th these were some of the th people that I met and heard and listened to who had a positive influence on right. my life and made me, steered me a little bit more towards religion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah, so actually it's interesting because you, I think we had talked, well, we, we've known each other for a few years. Yeah. And um, I think a few years ago when you shared some of your story with me, I remember 9-11 came up yes. in it. And so I want to talk a little bit about that yeah. with you. Um, so we're actually recording this. I think it's the day after 22 years yeah, yeah. after the actual event. Yeah. Um, and it actually, like, it amazes me that teenagers and even, like, early 20s weren't even alive yeah, you know, at, right. the <laughs> at that time. So you can just imagine even up to 30, probably people don't have any memory of it, right? So... Um, yeah, no, I just, I, I'm really curious in your experience uh, as somebody in the Muslim community, uh, how, how, what was your perception of that event? Um, was, did it have any kind of shaping force in your life or in your journey? Um, I mean, I've kind of heard it from on, on sort of another side of the tracks, like from some Christians. Mm -hmm. I think it propelled some of them into learning more about Islam and engage Muslims, maybe share the, the gospel as a Christian with Muslims. Um, and that might come from a very different perspective of maybe people were, are afraid. Uh, what, what is this religion um, and the association of the religious connection with that event? So I'm curious, kind of one, like from a personal perspective, experiential point in your journey how what was your experience of it um as well as then for especially for us as evangelical christians i'm i'm really interested for christians to hear from a de, like a devout muslim um, how they would see that those events um, and so if you can give a sense of your community i don't mean that you represent them but like if you were to say sort of the typical Muslim person um, in maybe in particular in the West, um, or if you can speak beyond that, how they would see the events of 9-11? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, like 9-11, 2001, obviously it was a human you know, tragedy. Uh, it should go without saying at this point that Islam does not condone target killing of civilians, of innocent people, right? Um, so yeah, that was, first of all, that was universally condemned by all Muslims, all Muslim organizations, you can name it, like whether it's the Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, this is a major center of uh, Sunni Muslim learning in the Middle East, whether it's the Dioband Seminary in India, or the scholars, the Shafi scholars of Hadarmot, like basically across the board, you know, not just Muslim organizations in the West. It's not like that. Oh, okay. Muslim organizations, universities, seminaries across the Muslim world all uh, condemn this action. So uh, that, that, that was obviously wrong. Um, but then since then, you know, it was used as an excuse, as a justification really for America to commit a lot of atrocities in the Middle East as well, which only further uh, fed that kind of vicious uh, cycle of, of, uh, of violence and so right. forth. Um, but yeah, on a personal level, I mean, obviously, um, 
at some point there was an increase in what is often referred to as Islamophobia, right? right? Uh, or just let, let's just say anti-Islamic sentiment. Sure. Anti-Muslim sentiment. Naturally, it led to an increase in that. I said at some point, because I think in the first year or two after 9-11, I think like people were still in shock and maybe mm -hmm. didn't know how to respond to it. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, you had the Pamela Gellers and the Robert Spencers and that Islamophobia machinery was at work. It was mobilizing, it was fundraising, um, and, and um, it was giving its version of education about Islam to the American masses. Um, so I think the real negative impact, as far as Islamophobia goes, was like several years after 9-11. I think that gave time for that whole anti-Islam industry to really grow. Um, and that's where I think um, probably, you know, I don't know, 2005 onwards, 2010 onwards, that's where I feel that anti-Islamic sentiment was really kind of at its height. That, that's how I felt, okay. anyhow, yeah. That's how I felt. Whereas now, um, on, on a positive note, like you were mentioning how a lot of young people now, young adults now, were not around when 9-11 happened. This is definitely a change that I've seen happen. Like, you know, on the street level where we do street sure. dawah, the, yeah. we do the outreach, give out free pamphlets mm -hmm. on Islam and stuff. When I'm talking to young people, um, I, I found that because they don't have that memory of 9-11, they're often not carrying that same kind of prejudice or that same baggage that okay. some older people are carrying. Okay. Like to my pleasant surprise, I meet 25 year olds uh -huh. and, and the default position, at least in Toronto, I can't speak for every city, but in Toronto, it seems to me like the average 25 year old has like a healthy respect for Islam. They, 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 they have had good experience with Muslim friends at school. Like non-Muslims. Yeah, non-Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 they'll be like, yeah, my friend's Muslim. Right. He fasts during Ramadan. Yeah, I went and had an iftar meal with him at the mosque. Um, and um, maybe also social media, Andrew Tate, whatever it is. But it seems to me like the average guy and girl, you know, in their 20s, by default, I don't assume that they're looking at me as a terrorist or as a suspicious person i think by default they're they have a healthy respect uh, mm. for islam maybe i'm wrong it, it seems like that to me okay let me let me bring it back to a little bit so that kind of maybe gives a, a big big picture perspective of of how you're seeing things i wonder did it did those that event in your personal experience did it have any sort of shaping or motivating factor for you in your journey? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, look, I, I was actually in Syria studying a bit of Arabic at the time. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I was like in a place that was potentially, you know, dangerous. We didn't know if like, is, is America going to invade Syria as well? Is it going to okay. invade the entire Middle East? Um, so yeah, that, that kind of, you know, caused my... I feel like it's my dangerous even just saying that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Syria, Syria before <laughs> ISIS. Yeah, yeah. Before <laughs> okay, ISIS just, is the I'm important kidding, disclaimer. ISIS didn't exist at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, my mother had a minor kind of uh, panic attack, you know, episode, you know, uh, due to that. And uh, then when I came back, um, I was visited by CSIS. Huh? Yeah, like CSIS came knocking on the door. And back then we weren't as... Um, maybe well-educated on our civil rights or our civil liberties, because like now I know I could just say, no, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, you know, I, uh, they, they called and they said they, they want to pay a visit and it, it was on a false pretext. I won't go into that okay, side sure. tangent, but really <laughs> they just wanted to know why I was in Syria. Um, but it was just a one-time visit. We had a nice conversation and uh, I think I think they concluded this guy's not a threat. But again, to answer your question, yes, it was a cause of anxiety, you know, to, to my family, to my parents, like right. for my mom. I mean, mothers worry, right? Of course. Uh, Sorry, so, what, yeah. what is CSIS? Exactly? Uh, yeah, this is what the Canadian Security this is like their Intelligence seals? Services. No, this is oh, the, the uh, Canadian... Um, like the Canadian CIA. The Canadian CIA. Yeah, yeah. the Canadian CIA, CIA would be a good way of... Uh, okay, they're, they're, uh, okay, they're intelligence yeah. branch. Yeah, yeah. They obviously haven't visited you. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. then you would know who they are. But uh, yeah. Are they CSIS visited you while you were in Syria? Uh, no, 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 no. When, when I came, came back, back to Canada, yeah because they wanted to know where I've been, what I was doing, that kind of a thing. Okay, gotcha. But, uh, but they used another pretext to come and visit me. Uh, but, but that's really what they wanted to know, and, and that's fine. Yeah, right. that's fine. 
But the point is that there are many, many Muslims after 9-11 who were visited like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and not everyone is, you know, maybe as, as confident as I am or something. And it was a cause of anxiety and concern to many Muslims who were being visited and who were being spied upon and this kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we'll move the questions more towards around interfaith dialogue. And these, uh, the first question that we have here is, I guess, so we're, obviously we're evangelicals and we're engaged yeah. in a lot of mission work in our local community. And so we're very used to sharing our faith and also like learning and training how to do it. So as coming from us, we, we're obviously very in favor of this. And... Um, as someone who does that as well, as in doing dawah and outreach, uh, what, what is it that motivates you to do that? Yeah, well, I'll actually reference a Christian tract or a Christian okay. pamphlet that I received like a long time ago, right? Um, and, and I remember it said something in there about it said, like, if you knew that your neighbor's house is on fire. Mm. Sounds like great comfort. Maybe it was, yeah. So, you know, what, 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 wouldn't yeah. you knock on the door? Wouldn't you bang on the door? Wouldn't you try to wake your neighbor up if his house is on fire? It's definitely so, very comfort. Right, yeah. <laughs> so as a Muslim, I mean, that, that made sense to me, right? And, yeah. and we have our own tradition, of course, of uh, evangelizing or proselytizing, sharing the message of Islam. Right. So that's one way to put it. Um, you know, if I believe that non-Muslims are in danger of hellfire they're, they're, uh, if, if they die in a state of disbelief then is it not incumbent on me morally to share the message of Islam with them right um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and I don't have a double standard on this I, I actually completely understand Christians who want to evangelize who want to spread you know the gospel to other people because if, if from your perspective mm -hmm. if the only way I can go to paradise is if I believe that Jesus is God and He's my personal Lord and Savior. He died for my sin. Why wouldn't you want to share that message right. with me? Why wouldn't you, right? right? And uh, it might not be a great reference, but the, the show Seinfeld, you know, there was a popular sitcom in the 90s. I, yeah, he's, he's young, yeah, I think. Younger, I know of it. I didn't watch it. Right, right, no. which is good. Oh. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. I'm not encouraging anybody to watch it. But there was an episode, I don't know if you might recall, but... Um, what's her name? Elaine? Elaine, yeah. Elaine, Elaine, right. Um, so anyhow, Elaine is just a lost soul and uh, secular non-religious liberal sleeping around that kind of a pr um but somehow uh, she she gets an evangelical boyfriend she's got an evangelical christian uh, I don't boyfriend remember this. oh okay all right <laughs> well <laughs> they stereotype great. you guys too because this I wasn't a christian when i would have yeah, watched it yeah right so right but yeah, they stereotype yeah. you guys too because this evangelical christian is he's a real um, mimbo Okay, of a bimbo. Yeah, okay, he's yeah, a mimbo. Yeah. He's a really dumb, he's a dunce, he's not an intelligent guy or anything. But he's very blunt about his faith too. So at one point it clicks like in, in Elaine's mind. She says, wait a minute, like if you're a Christian and, and all, like does that mean, like, like, uh, like do you believe that I'm going to help? doesn't believe in Christianity she's a completely secular non-religious mm -hmm. type but on a logical level she reasons it out that okay but if my boyfriend believes that I'm going to help yeah why isn't he trying to save me right he should be trying to make me a Christian right so uh, no so I understand and, and I appreciate and by the way this is not limited just to religion because right. I know people get really yeah, turned yeah. off when it comes to religious proselytization. Everyone is proselytizing, man. Everyone right. is proselytizing. If, if you're a vegan, for instance, if you're a vegan, if you believe that veganism is the correct you know, ethical code to live by, why would you want to be the only vegan on the planet? Wouldn't you want your family members to also live by this uh, ethical code? Right. Right. And where do you draw the lines? Wouldn't you want, ideally, in an ideal world, wouldn't you want everyone on your street, in your community, your right. neighborhood, in your country? Wouldn't you want them to abide by those vegan ethics? Well, right. even if it wasn't just an, even if it wasn't an ethical thing, even if it was just on the level of health. Or even right? on the level of you health, You might yeah. want other people to be more healthy. Whatever values you believe are good or beneficial, mm -hmm. if, if you're anti-abortion, if you're pro-abortion, why would you want to be the only woman that has the right to abortion? Wouldn't you want all the women on your street, all right. the women in your community, all the women in Canada mm -hmm. to have that uh, right to abortion, if that's what you believe. Right. So likewise, it should be like that for Muslims and Christians as well. 
Yeah, there's a famous, uh, well, maybe it's not that famous, but a lot of Christians know about like this clip with, um, uh, what's his name, Penn from Penn and Teller. I don't know if you've seen no. this clip where he's, no. he's basically, he's saying essentially. It's too late for me to say I don't watch TV, right? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's, on you, it's on YouTube. Okay. okay yeah, okay, but right. um, YouTube doesn't count, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, YouTube. But, right. Um, no, he basically says he appreciates, even though he's an atheist, he appreciates, like, even after his shows and stuff, evangelical Christians sometimes come up to him and try to share the gospel with him and, and basically re- warn him to repent and, and, and believe in Jesus uh, because he's going to go to hell otherwise. So he says, actually, I really appreciate because if you actually believe that I'm going to hell, what, like, why would you not tell me that? Right. Right. So it's to the same point. Right. Right. So from an Islamic perspective, like we are a universal religion, just like Christianity. So I like to, you know, remind people, including fellow Muslims, that Islam does not belong to the Arabs. It doesn't belong to the Turks or the Indians or the Persians or the West Africans. It's a message for all of humanity. Right. Just as you see Christianity. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I think you basically answered the next, like, two questions on the <laughs> list written in that in that little thing. That's good. You have one there? That's because I can well, see over your shoulder well, and I can well, see the question. You kind of have, <laughs> you kinda have, but uh, I think just to, to dig into it a little bit more, maybe. Um, so then what do you think of people who don't share their faith? Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I don't. I don't automatically think bad of, of, of them because, sure. um, like, look, I'm, I'm looking at this through an Islamic perspective, right, yep. and how our scholars have explained it. And so um, from what I understand, you know, dawah or inviting non-Muslims to Islam, from what I've understood, is, is not an individual obligation, but it's, mm-hmm. it's a, a communal obligation. Some mm-hmm. people might disagree with me on that, though. Sure. But communal obligation would mean that, like, look, the Muslims in Canada there has to be a set of Muslim individuals who do this work. Or there have to be organizations that are set up that will do this work. But it doesn't mean that each and every Muslim has to go and propagate Islam. Mm-hmm. You know? Although indirectly, we always should be, obviously, through our behavior, through our actions, we should be representing Islam and be good ambassadors of Islam. But to explicitly call people to Islam to set up a table on the street and give out booklets. This is not an obligation on every single individual Muslim. Um, So no, I wouldn't automatically uh, think bad of a Muslim who doesn't have the ability or doesn't have the, um, is an introvert and is not able to do that. But what I would say is that all of us are still a representative of our faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if if every Muslim was just a good Muslim, uh, that itself will be great dawah. That itself will be a great you know advertisement for Islam. Um, It pains me when I open up the newspaper and some 23-year-old is arrested for theft at a gas station. And what's his name? Oh, Ahmed, Ahmed Ali or Muhammad. That pains me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That pains me just as much as some caricature drawn of the prophet you know okay yeah well it's interesting in talking about dawah or you know for those who are not familiar it's basically for from a christian perspective basically evangelism but for yeah. islam uh it means to like call to or invite right right, right. so and actually i th- i thought of it, we we're going to have this conversation actually this was the first quran i ever got and read through mm. and this was you know it's kind of a cheap edition of a yusuf ali translation that mm. was given out i think it was downtown toronto okay um and actually somebody else who got it from there gave it to me I so see. that christian and it was i was at seminary at the time so the guy didn't wasn't interested and i'm like well i'm interested in learning about yes, it so yes. so it, I, the reason i brought it too was it's kind of like you might think that like from a okay so from a christian vantage point sometimes we think well who cares about giving out tracts or, or brochures or mm-hmm. pamphlets or whatever yeah. like who who knows like is if people just throw them away, mm. like probably 99 out of 100 are thrown away and not read, mm. right? And so people might think, like, what's the value in doing all of that? And sometimes we, I, you probably have similar stories mm. as a Muslim, but as Christians, we sometimes hear this like crazy story. This somebody just like found a tract, or yeah. and then it led them to faith, and like nobody knew anything about it, so they don't mm. know where it went. Mm. Yes. So yes. I was just thinking, like, it kind of reminded me of that idea. Well, here you've got. Okay, I'm a Christian pastor, so I I got my first Quran because it was through some guy gave a Quran on the street to a Christian guy who gave it to another Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And I, I want to also, so let's, let's go to the kind of uh, another question I have. Hmm. So as I've been reading through the Quran uh, a few times, and sometimes I find these verses um, or ayat in the Quran that um, are sort of similar, I think, to what the Bible says about sharing our faith or sharing the gospel, or in this case, obviously, sharing Islam. And there were a couple of verses I want to share and see if you had any thoughts about it related to how you share your faith and principles about sharing your faith. And so in uh, Surah, uh, Surah 29, Ayah 46, it says, Do not argue with the people of the book unless gracefully, except with those of them who act wrongfully. And we say we believe in what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you our god and your god is one and to him we fully submit in particular the first line was what stood out to me don't argue with the people of the book so i guess that's jews and christians uh but it, maybe it applies to everybody um and less gracefully yeah. right so yeah argue but do it gracefully right right, right. and then there was a another one in um now i'm forgetting it but do you have any thoughts about that verse? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent reminder, like mm -hmm. to me and other people who engage like in interfaith discussions. And I think it's also a good reminder for young people on the internet, <laughs> mm -hmm. because when the internet- In the comments section. Exactly, <laughs> because the internet affords us anonymity. But if we're true believers, whether Christian, a Christian believer or a Muslim believer, we, we should realize that we're never anonymous to God, right? Like, like no, God's uh, yeah. CCTV camera is on, is on us 24-7. So it doesn't mean that when I'm behind a keyboard, now I can suddenly start ripping apart your scripture and insulting you know, what is sacred to you and, uh, or insulting you personally. So yeah, th this should really be a given, I think. I think like mature people on both sides uh, should realize that uh, we can definitely disagree. We do disagree. We ha we have different theologies, right? But th but there's a way to disagree, and um, and ultimately, I mean, you're not going to win anybody over by insulting them or insulting their prophet. That that will not win anybody over ever. <laughs> you know? yeah, the, yeah. The the other verse was uh, Surah 16, Ayah 125, it says, "Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and kind advice, with wisdom and quite kind advice, and only debate with them in the best manner." Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, I, there is one thought that occurs to me. I remember one scholar giving the example, you know, he asked the audience, you know, what's your favorite food? Think of your favorite food, mm -hmm. right? So someone is saying spaghetti, pizza, or biryani, whatever, right? He says, okay, now imagine somebody offering you a wonderful dish of biryani in a shoe or yeah. offering you a pizza slice in a shoe, in a slipper. Would, would you like to take that? Would you like to eat that? Obviously not. So, uh, so how we present the message is, is, is just as important as the message itself. And, and it's part of the message itself too, how we, uh, how we convey the message. Yeah, actually, I, that last point too, the shoe is kind of interesting to mm. <laughs> think about. But the last point, it's part of the message. I mean, right. for as Christians, this is why I would also say when when we share so there's a there's a statement in ephesians 4 i think it's verse 15 um it says uh to speak the truth in love mm. um and there's in first peter three fifteen is to be prepared to give anyone an answer for the hope that's in you with but with gentleness and respect right. so i see a lot of the same kind of emphasis there but to your point also about it is actually part of the message how we do it mm. Uh, from a biblical standpoint, our message is about ultimately the love of God and uh, God's sacrifice for us. So if we're, if I'm doing it in a an abrasive, mm. hostile, or mm. disrespectful manner, mm. or attacking the person, like, is that really in consonance with mm. the message itself, which is mm. about how Christ died for you, et cetera, right? right? right. So I, I know we differ on the doctrine, yeah, but yeah. but the similarity, I think it is part of the message. Yeah. Maybe the part of the message, correct me if I'm wrong, would then be, well, it's essentially the mercy of Allah. Hmm. So if you're going to be extending the offer of mercy of Allah to people, are you going to do that in an unmerciful way? Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and a couple of other, I mean, verses that occurred to me, I'm just paraphrasing yeah, from yeah. the Quran. One of, in one of them, 
you know, God says to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that your job is but to convey the message. You know, it's not to persuade people. It's not to ultimately convince them. It's to convey the message. So we're kind of seed planters. We're just planting the seed. And then what happens after that, we're not, uh, we're not held responsible for that. So this could take us on a sidetrack, but the, the, I've heard some people make that statement. And it's interesting that you also explain it by saying it's not about trying to persuade. But, and Christians say this kind of, they ultimately, don't use the, ultimately. Okay, yeah, okay, ultimately, yeah. okay, well, that maybe this yeah, will be yeah, a helpful yeah, yeah, thing yeah, you yeah, can yeah. explain because yeah. some, a lot of Christians I hear, maybe more so Calvinists and maybe Charismatics, mm. they will really emphasize, well, just leave it to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who changes hearts, mm. just to say that God changes the hearts. Mm. And both Muslims and Christians I, I've heard say similar kind of thing, not about the Holy Spirit, but about, well, nobody converts anybody, it's God who converts the heart, right? So, okay, well, yeah, maybe in an ultimate sense, but I like to just kind of be a bit more real. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's kind of a pious sentiment, like a religious sentiment to say, okay, I'm trusting in God, like mm-hmm. I, will, I will rely on him to produce the results. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it isn't just that, because if I, if I don't actually try to give in a good argument, or like on an intellectual level, or I don't, explain my analogy well or uh i don't do it in the man like a morally good manner like mm. we were just talking about then why would they want to eat the biryani from the shoe mm, yes, right yes, yes so um i do think persuasion actually is mm. part and parcel of communicating it mm. otherwise what do you it's not like we're just throwing it out there and right, who right, cares right. Uh, because we care about the person, we want them to believe. So mm. we want to try to persuade them. Well, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, okay. absolutely. That's that's why I needed to make the disclaimer that in the ultimate sense, so that okay. one is not left with a bitter taste in their mouth or frustrated. That, okay, why didn't this person convert even after I tried to persuade him, even after I tried to convince him? Because well, ultimately, that sure. divine light is gonna of guidance is gonna come from God. Ultimately. But sometimes it kind of. We can say maybe it's our fault. <laughs> like yeah, if, I, yeah. if I if was I was a jerk to the person, yes, or yeah, yeah. I might think, well, yeah, actually, no, I really didn't explain that well. Mm-hmm. I need to do better right, at, right. at articulating it. Um, or maybe they brought up a point that I didn't have an answer to, but there is an answer to yes. it. And if I had that answer, it could have helped. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I do think that you know all of that is it goes together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Good. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I guess the next question I'd like to ask I guess I'd, I'd li- we'd like to hear briefly what is it you appreciate about talking with Christians well what I appreciate uh, about talking with you know obviously religious Christians devout Christians is their passion for God um, and their concern about uh, salvation about the afterlife in fact, I think you know the reason Muslims and Christians probably get into more heated religious debates with each other than any other religious group out there is probably because we have so much in common. You know what I mean? Right. I, I wouldn't be sure exactly where to start the debate with a Buddhist or with a Hindu, but it's because you and I both believe in God that we can debate about why I think you have the wrong idea about God and you can right. debate about why you think I have the wrong idea about God. It's because we both believe that it's important to follow Jesus that we can debate so passionately about Jesus. Right. You got Jesus wrong. No, you got Jesus wrong. So um, that's something that I appreciate about Christians. And um, But at the same time, I will say that this kind of, uh, this, this reconfirms my faith and trust in the Quran too because in the Quran it actually says in chapter 5 verse 82 that the nearest in affection to the believers meaning the nearest in affection to the Muslims uh, you will find those who say we are Christians right chapter 582 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so the Quran actually actually acknowledges this that out of all of the different religious groups there those who are closest in love to the Muslims those who are most concerned about loving God and following God and submitting to God uh, are, are, are those people who call themselves Christians and um, I mean even in the Lord's Prayer right like uh, th- thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so it, it, it's it's I appreciate that Christians are seeking to do God's will mm. you know 
which which uh, which is actually the definition of a Muslim. Really, I'm not saying Christians are Muslims. I'm just saying right, that right. a Muslim means one who submits to the will of God. Right. And I recognize Christians as people who want to do that. They they want to seek out the will of God right. in heaven and on earth. So the verse you mentioned actually. Like I'm going to read it. So yeah. it's a, and I'm wondering if you. So I think you're highlighting the Christian part, but there's another part that's kind of interesting. Yes. It says you will surely find the most bitter toward the believers. So that's toward the Muslims, to be the Jews and the polytheists, and the most gracious to be those who call themselves Christian. Mm-hmm. So I think you're highlighting the second part. But it, I wonder if would you would you echo the first part too? Not to say that you wouldn't dis. Disagree yeah, with it, but yeah, yeah, but but the second part is echoing the New Testament as well too, right? Like, sure. like the the, okay. uh, the what is in the New Testament is it the the contrary that the, the the Jews are contrary to all men or something like this. So I, I'm I'm not going that far, but I'm saying that uh, yes, it does seem to me like if you look at it on an international level today. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of it wasn't meant to be a gotcha. No no, 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 no. I know. I'm sorry, but but yeah, I mean Israel and uh, now the resurgence of uh, Hindu fundamentalism in India. These are okay. possibly like the two biggest threats uh, to to Muslims today, like on the international level. Most of the hate comments that I have to go through and sift through and delete on my YouTube channel is not come it, I don't think it's coming from white Christians or white atheists or any I, it most of it's coming now from uh, Hindus in India okay uh, most of the hate comments I'm getting nowadays so the reason I bring that up is that again it's very interesting for a long time uh, verses like these I thought didn't speak like to the moment they they the, the, the capture a moment in history right because that's the, way yeah, back then, but exactly the okay. immediate context of that verse when it says polytheist it's talking about the pagan Arabs in yeah, the seventh right. century who were the immediate you know uh, right, enemies Indian, of the early Muslims yeah. exactly so I thought okay I mean you know uh, the Jewish part I can see that Israel is still you know a, a, a problem there for the Palestinians and so forth um, but I didn't see the polytheist side but now with the resurgence of uh, of Hinduism and Hindutva in India, like these verses to me, they seem like as as if it's been revealed yesterday. These uh, these verses too also stood out in uh, thirty nine, sir thirty nine thirty two to thirty three. Uh, to go back to your point about like why we might be more like, I don't know if you were saying hotly debating or like uh, have more contention hmm. uh, or contending for our faith more hmm. between each other as Christians and Muslims. Uh, the Quran says, who then does more wrong than those who lie about God and reject the truth after it has reached them? Is hell not a fitting home for the disbelievers? And the one who has brought the truth and those who embrace it, it is they who are the righteous. So there's a real emphasis, which I appreciate on both the the, the, the claim of objective truth that the that uh, the Quran is and Islam is is claiming just like we are claiming in the Bible mm-hmm. um, as well as then the implications of that if it's rejected right right isn't it fitting actually that we are separated from God and however we want to characterize mm-hmm. our eternal punishment mm-hmm. um, that we would reject it after we hear it and after mm-hmm. we understand it and so on right. so you know I to me I'm motivated to share uh, the biblical message with Muslims uh, because I think there is such an agreement like you said mm-hmm. on the importance of knowing the truth and following the truth because the implication is that right mm-hmm. for for either one of us if one yeah. of like we're not both right no so, exactly Craig, exactly what, what is the reference on that one uh, just 30, so I can put yeah, it on the screen Surah 39 the verses on. 32 to 33 okay and by the way, that reminds me of something funny, which is that when, when I get like um, a deist uh, or just some kind of a non-religious person who believes in God and they say, well, how can I know which religion is true? There's so many religions out there. There's so many gods out there. There's so many books out there. I say, look, <laughs> as far as I know, there's only two of them that are making an, an ob- a claim to objective truth mm. and making exclusivist claims saying this is the way i think there's there are more so yeah but but uh it's not a ton i Mm -hmm. like it's not a ton of them like uh, i just i've more recently been reading some of the guru grasab which is the sikh scriptures okay and there are statements that are made about other scriptures so the the guru grasab mentions the vedas the 
Puranas, the Shastras, mm. and so like kind of Hindu texts and and Buddhist texts, and it also does mention the Quran and mm. Islamic books, yeah. which uh, and 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 basically says that those are not sufficient for salvation. Are you sure about yes, that? Yes, I'm sure. Because so, in my practical experience, I've that, never met a proselytizing that, Sikh who said like you are in danger, your soul is in danger if right. you don't become a Sikh. Right. But but I mean ultimately it doesn't really matter and that, so that that's what the text says mm. and um, you know I'm interested to have conversations with Sikhs to kind of talk about actually that issue because yeah. because I do wonder like you know if I was a Sikh and I think that this is the right way mm. to go like this is how I achieve uh, you know like uh, moksha or, or liberation in that in that system yeah yeah and it's not through it's and it's not through hindu pra- hindu practices yeah. definitely i mean like S- sikhis sikhs really emphasize they're not hindus right right, right? so there is a yes. not only this is what we are but what we're not yes right yes, yes. so yeah i wonder why why don't they share more like do they not care about us mm. that, that they don't share about their message that they believe is true mm. Um, but I would say there's a, as as I think in all of our communities, there's a difference between what is taught mm. in the text and then what people actually do, right? So just because a Muslim doesn't a doesn't do dawa a lot mm. or even much at all, okay, maybe be, be in terms of articulating it beyond their lifestyle, um, that that doesn't mean that the Quran doesn't teach that. And it doesn't mean the Quran doesn't make an exclusive claim. So we might not see it in certain communities that maybe appear to be more pluralistic in their theology, but actually ultimately aren't. Because you can't say that, I would, I, mean, I would say, you can't say that God is impersonal in, a, in, in one religion and then say, yeah, you guys are fine. Like you believe in a personal creator God as a Muslim and uh, you believe that, okay, we're, we're going to hell because we believe in the wrong thing about God and how we're reconciled to him. Mm. And uh, we believe that you believe the wrong thing about him. So mm. like there, there's, I do think it, it just makes sense that you would want to share with others. I mm. think maybe why there's a tendency, and this is my perspective at this point, as a, this point in my journey in studying, I would say, I think in more pantheistic or monistic religions, like Indian uh, religions, like maybe Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Mm -hmm. um, because if you believe there's more than one life, then you have more than one shot. That was going to be my backup argument. That that's maybe that's a gotcha argument, which is that, okay, even on the view that um, I messed up as a Muslim because I eat meat. And let's say some Hindu says that's not the proper way to live. Uh, in accordance with the universe and harmony with the universe or whatnot. Uh, the fact that the fact that they all believe in reincarnation means that you get a makeup test. I call it a makeup test. Yeah. And if you're going to get an endless series of makeup tests, you don't have to stay up all night sweating and studying over the exam. It's like if you pass, you pass. If you fail, you fail. Mm-hmm. Right? But again, Islam and Christianity, not all forms of Christianity today, but uh, at least your form of Christianity and Islam definitely they believe in heaven they believe that there's hell you know there's salvation and then there's damnation uh, and so in order to avoid and and we both believe that this life is this is what we've got this, yeah. we're in the final exam that's going to determine right the result yeah. so i i still think that for those people who kind of use this as an excuse that well, there's, there's just so many religions which one is true i don't think they're seriously considering uh Greco-Roman religion. I don't think they're seriously, you know. I, I think you can boil it down to Christianity and Islam, as far as I'm concerned. You know. Right. Yeah. Mm, great. I like that take. Um, so let's talk a little bit about double standards. I mean, you mentioned it earlier that you have none, basically, uh, which is great. We appreciate that. We appreciate that a lot. But we're wondering about double standards among Christian apologists and missionaries who critique Islam, and um, I mean, this is this is a question more coming from Greg was the one that initially worded this question. Um, I'm trying to think of how I bring this to you. How did you? What did you want him to well, let me comment just, on exactly? Well, let me on just the say. Standards? So the reason why I want to ask this question about identifying double standards in the Christian community, in in like Christian apologists or evangelists or missionaries who especially focus on talking about Islam and and trying to reach Muslims um, is because I really value 
not having double standards Mm -hmm. and I don't like it when um, our faith is and the scriptures and Christ are misrepresented so um, and I also believe that we need to represent the other side accurately Mm -hmm. Um, and as we were talking about before the kind of the best ways of best practices for that is we do it with gentleness we do it with respect we uh, we don't attack the person and many things right Mm -hmm. so um, I actually I see a lot of the times when Christians are Christian apologists are whether it's in videos or debates or whatever it is or teaching about it which might not be as accessible to uh, Muslims in the like in the Muslim community what a Christian saying about how to train for reaching Muslims because mm. I know that it's on the flip side too right mm. but um, I do think that there there is a lot of accusation that the other side has a lot of double standards. Mm. But I see it actually on both sides. So I don't think it's just the Christian side, but I think that there is a focus by Christians of accusing Muslim apologists and uh, da'is and and Muslims of, and I'm not saying they're necessarily wrong all the time, but but I think there's a, um, they're, they're, they're blinded to their own sometimes. So I'm really curious to hear from a Muslim, especially someone who's engaged in da'wah and, and talks to other Christians, maybe even other Christian apologists and stuff. What's your taking on it? What are some examples of double standards you see in the Christian community? Because I believe that there's a need to correct uh, our own side and not let it just be the other side to say, no, you're what you're and trying to argue with them. No, we, we should take care of our own. Yeah. Right. So that's why. Yeah. 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 Well, firstly, I mean, let me start by saying uh, I'm not sure if I said I don't have any double standards. You know, I mean, I, I probably <laughs> I, do. I was wondering. About yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 what I what I would like to believe is that if I identify uh, a double standard, you know, that I'm working with, then I'll try to like stop that or I'll try to eliminate right. that, you know, mm-hmm. from my future conversations. And but yeah, genuinely, thank you for asking this question. I really appreciate like the opportunity to speak on it. And I know you're going to ask me the flip version of that sure. too. That's fine. Um, so uh, yeah, there there are there are a few, and I don't want to make it too long. But I mean, here here's a couple that I would uh, identify. One is um, that there are aspects of the Sharia or the Islamic sacred law that Christians will sometimes critique and uh, say that whatever it might be, like women covering up, having to cover their heads, that's misogynist, mm-hmm. or. Uh, uh, the uh, death penalty for like adultery, mm-hmm. right? And there's a lot of conditions attached to that, to yeah. proving adultery. But okay, let's say as uh, in the Bible, yeah, <laughs> right. But but yeah. just so many people just don't realize that. So yeah. many Christians don't realize that, right? Uh, and and so and so their argument seems to be that you know Islam cannot be true because if God is loving and merciful towards His creation, He wouldn't be so cruel as to reveal like these kinds of harsh laws, right? Um, and yeah, I, I see that as a double standard because God revealed such laws in the Old Testament, right? And I understand that modern day Christians don't believe that any of those laws are applicable today because we're in a some, new covenant. Some Christians. Okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but generally speaking, these kind of uh, criminal laws have been superseded, done away with, fulfilled, however you want to uh, put it. So, so that, that's fine. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, most Christians today are trying to establish a Christian theological state in which adulterers will be killed. That's not my, my point. That's not my argument. My point is mm-hmm. that, I think you get it, that, that, yeah. that, that they cannot say that it is beyond God to reveal such harsh laws when, according to the Old Testament, God did indeed reveal such harsh right even if even if we're not wanting it now or we're not fighting for it now then like from for those christians i'm actually not really one of those christians but (laughs) so i i do stand more by uh old testament law yeah but but to your point even if i was taking that kind of well that was old testament that doesn't apply now or something in some whatever form it did apply at one point yes so this is actually a point that i often critique other christians about and press them on to say you can't just do away with Mosaic law or Old Testament law and say, well, that, that was then. You still would have to defend that it was justifiable then. Right, right. Right? 
So uh, yeah, a lot of uh, the other points that I have in my head basically relate to, uh, there are similar kinds of examples, right? So I mean, About Old Testament things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so death penalty for apostasy, right? Again, I want to make the disclaimer because we have limited time here. I mean, there's oh, many yeah. conditions attached to that, right? Okay. Death penalty for apostates. But, but fundamentally, if there's a death penalty for apostates, if that makes Islam a cult, well, then what, what do you call the religion of Moses, right? Mm -hmm. Because under the Mosaic law, uh, a Jew who goes and worships uh, false gods, he's mm -hmm. to be stoned at the gate of the, uh, the, the city gates, right? Mm -hmm. So does that mean God, you know, taught Moses to establish a cult, right? So, so an atheist might be able to say something like that, but I think if a Christian or a Jew says something like that, and they're a devout Jew, they're a religious Christian, then that would be a double standard. Atheists wouldn't have the objective s basis to say it, but... Yeah, what is I evil? Know you're I know, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I mean, how, how do you... Double their standard. double standard would be even to call anything evil at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you get yeah. off saying that? But mm -hmm. yeah. If I may uh, give one other example, which yeah. is very uh, important to me. Um, in the verse you quoted earlier on from chapter 29 about not disputing with the people of the 46, book, not arguing yeah, think, with yeah. them, yeah, except in the, in, the, in the better way. If you remember, it ended by saying, um, you know, say to them, we believe in the revelation which has come down to us and that which came down to you. Right. Uh, our God and your God is one, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, or is, it what is it one or same? Is, is, is one, is okay. one, yeah. Ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid, right? Okay. Um, but, but, but I mean, that, 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 uh, that also implies the same, yeah, that they are one and the same. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, generally speaking, uh, Jews, I would argue most Christians, because for me, you know, I'm not going to sift through who I think is a true Christian and who's a false Christian. For me, Catholics, Orthodox, anyone who claims to be a Christian, uh, anyone who would get... Uh, uh, lumped into the unit under Christianity in a world religions textbook uh, that that for me is a Christian, right? Um, so so m most people who call themselves Christians most Catholics wouldn't have any qualms or reservations today About saying that Muslims worship the same one God the same one monotheistic God That Jews and Christians believe in that spoke to Abraham that spoke to Isaac that spoke to Moses, right? Um, however I can understand and appreciate the counter argument that comes from some okay. evangelical Christians. Yeah, right. because an evangelical Christian could say that, wait a minute, the, the true God, the Christian God is triune. Mm -hmm. It consists of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. The Muslim God is not triune. The mm -hmm. Muslim God does not consist of Father, Son, yeah. and Holy Ghost. Therefore, it's a different God. Right. Therefore, it's a false God. Or, uh, depending on how central uh, Jesus is, to your belief and your worship and your liturgy, depending on which denomination you're in. You could even put it even more bluntly and directly by saying that, according to Christians, uh, Jesus is God. God is Jesus. And Muslims don't worship Jesus, mm -hmm. which means Muslims are not worshiping God. They're worshiping something other than God. Therefore, Muslims are worshiping mm -hmm. a false God. I can understand that logic. Right. I, I can understand that argument or that perspective from some evangelical okay. Christians. But my objection is the double standard because okay. most of those evangelical Christians would not say the same thing about the Jewish God or the God that Jews worship. Let's put it that way. The God mm -hmm. that Jews worship today in synagogues, yep. they would not say Jews are worshiping a false God. I've right. met very few evangelical Christians like that. But if you yep. apply the same test, if you apl apply the Trinity test to the Jewish God, well, Jews don't believe God is triune. Jews not only do they not worship Jesus, but many of them have a very bad, nasty um, uh, opinion about Jesus. Right. Um, how is it that they get this kind of out of jail card free, right? Uh, sorry, out of out of, uh, out, out, of, out of out of jail card. Yeah. Um, so my point here is not that I want I want you to hate on Jews too. <laughs> not, not you personally, but I mean those well, evangelical. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My point is not hey, if you're gonna hate on me, man. Come on, you gotta hate on the Jews even more than you hate on me. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I don't want anyone to hate on anybody. Mm -hmm. But my point is, I am interested in identifying that concept, which neither one of us is very um, fond of the term, but Islamophobia, right? I think that can be an example of Islamophobia mm -hmm. because it's not purely theologically driven. I if it was driven by theology, then you should object to the God that Jews worship. At the very least, you should say uh, that's not a complete understanding of God, right? right. Um, 
but if, if only Muslim worship, if only the Muslim concept of God is being targeted with that methodology, uh, I just, I'm not convinced that that's purely theology speaking now. It's something else speaking. It could be anti-immigrant sentiment. It could be racism. There's something else at work here. There's some other variable at play here. Because if it was purely theology, you would say both Muslims and Christians, you're worshiping a false god. Because you're not worshiping Jesus. So I have, I have some thoughts I want to share about that. So one is, uh, so I think for some Christians, uh, they might think of Judaism as, and actually I, I accept your point, but, uh, but to give some context, I think some Christians might think of um, like non-Messianic Jews, the, like rabbinic Jews, as wor- potentially like they're talking about the same God, they're, they're, they're worshiping the same God, but not, but still they're, as a Christian, we're going to say, not worshiping rightly, right? Not that they have a right relationship with God, but it could still be referring to the same God. I think that the reason that some Christians would think that way may be about the God of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism and the God of Islam differently Without them realizing it, they're probably unconsciously thinking, well, Judaism was before, whereas Islam is after. So it's kind of like Islam is the reaction and saying no to the Christian God, Mm. right? Whereas Jews were already there. So it's not that they were saying no. Like the the Jewish people might, by and large, be saying no, but the religion was already there. But actually, I would say that's actually historically inaccurate because rabbinic Judaism is is post-Christian. It's not pre-Christian. It, there are there are roots that that are go there, but all, so are the Christian roots. So, because rabbinic Judaism really formally, like concretized after the destruction of the Temple in the seventy A.D. with the Council of Jamnia or Yavna in the year ninety, because it was the Pharisaical movement that was there during contemporaneous with Jesus and the apostles and the beginnings of the Christian movement that was before seventy A.D. Mm-hmm that the Pharisees, what that was the sect of Judaism that survived the destruction of the temple and then continued on and evolved after that into what we now call rabbinic Judaism. So I think somebody might think of, yeah, Jew, Judaism goes, is like Old Testament, that's before, but actually the form, the, the theological, like present reality of, of, uh, of rabbinic Judaism actually isn't really before. There's, it claims to have be a continuation of it, but so does Christianity, right? And so does Islam. So um, now I would say there is also a distinction I would make or a question that we should be raising in this conversation. Some philosophers who have discussed this question, is Allah, are, are Muslims talking or worshiping the same God? I would say let's maybe put worship aside because we could say, well, you can't really be worshiping unless you're rightly doing it. So if worship carries that rightful context, then we would say, well, you're going to say to me, well, you're worshiping Jesus, that's not God. And so you're wrongly worshiping mm-hmm. the God you're maybe even saying is the same God as mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas I would say, well, you're not worshiping Jesus. And so the, mm-hmm. it goes both ways, right? Mm-hmm. But so if we take worship out of it and we say, are we talking about the same God? Are we referring mm. to the same God mm-hmm. when we're talking about right. God, capital G? Yeah. Then I do think there is more ambiguity and more debate that can be had about that because I do think we could, because we can have disagreements, maybe there's even, I'm not sure, maybe there's disagreements that you could think of even between Muslims about maybe attributes of God or something like that. And you could say, well, that's an inner, inner debate, mm. okay? But you're not going to say, well, that Muslim is not a Muslim. Right, and there, and then that Muslim it doesn't isn't talking about the same God, mm. but maybe they're making the wrong description about God. Right, right. So we could say, well, maybe we're ta- referring to the same being, mm. but we're making different descriptions about that with yeah. intending to talk about the same being, yeah. but we're mm. some of us are wrong. Yeah, yeah, does exactly. That, does that it, make sense? It, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so an analogy might be. Um, if, if you were, for example, to say that Donald Trump is a terrible person, he's corrupt, he's stolen millions of tax uh, d- dollars, right, from, from the public, right? 
And I, I say, like how you use non-controversial examples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just an example. And and I were to say that no, Donald Trump is a great guy, man. He gives a lot to charity, and uh, you know he's 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 not like what you're describing at all. I don't okay. believe he's molested any women. I think <laughs> okay. oh, right, right. So are okay. we talking yeah. about the same Donald Trump? So I, I I think yeah. Again, there's a bit of ambiguity there because one could say that we're right. talking about like no, we're talking about two different people here. Clearly, we are attempting to s- talk and speak about the same person, but one of us or or maybe both of us has has his description wrong sure yeah 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 all right good stuff and again that's not to liken donald trump to god (laughs) (laughs) of course Uh, not (laughs) of course not um maybe the maybe the arguments greg Uh, well uh actually maybe we covered that already yeah so um are there are there any other arguments or views you have heard Christians articulate about Islam that you think are incorrect or, or misguided, even if they're not based in double standards? So like like just inaccuracies or misrepresentations. Yes. So in inaccurate understanding that many Protestant Christians have about Islam, uh, which is not based on a double standard. You know, I can't say, oh, that you know, you're you're, yeah. you're judging by a double standard. It's, 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 it might it might be a genuine misunderstanding. It might be depending on what point of reference you're coming from uh is that uh islam is just a works oriented religion Hmm. and you have to earn your salvation Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you haven't prayed enough if you haven't done this enough you haven't been good enough uh then you know there there there, there, there is no way you can uh, get into heaven so uh no i mean the quran when it describes you know the people of paradise it's those who alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat they believed they had faith meaning the correct faith and they did good deeds. So these two things, you know, go hand in hand. Uh, I always like to say that the description that I read of faith and good works in the Epistle of James, mm-hmm. that is something no Muslim would ever uh, contradict, I think, or sure. have a, any problem with that, that description there. Um, and in an authentic, uh, so this is not a Christianization of Islam. This is like in our sources, uh, in an authentic hadith, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to his companions, none of you will enter paradise by your good deeds alone. So, I mean, it's very explicit. None of you will enter by your good deeds alone because of your, just because of your fasting and your praying and the length of your beard and the position of your hijab on your head. None of you, um, but by the mercy of God. And then one of the companions asked him, not even you, O messenger of Allah. And he said, not even me, except that the grace and the mercy of God you know, encompasses me. Mm-hmm. So we believe ultimately it's by God's mercy and grace. Mm-hmm. Um, now maybe we do something to, uh, I don't want to say deserve, maybe <laughs> trigger uh, God's mercy and, and grace. Well, you're but, saying it's uh, yeah. faith and works, right? Yeah. So it's not ju- it's not works alone mm-hmm. and it's not faith alone, but it's faith and, is that what you're saying? Faith alone has a better, uh, has a, uh, Islam, w- it's more accurate to say faith be, alone, not works? It would, be, it would works. be more accurate to say faith alone than actions alone because there's also a hadith in which Prophet, peace be upon him, said that at a point will come when God will turn to the hellfire and say that is there anyone left that has even a mustard seed right. you know, of faith left in the divine unity and the oneness of God and believing in his messengers. So we believe that every Muslim uh, no matter how bad, if they were indeed a Muslim and they mm-hmm. believed in the oneness of God and the, all of his prophets, uh, they, they would all eventually be saved. I think Even I, if they served uh, a time in hell. Might a be a different hadith, but I'm thinking of there's a, I think it's in Bukhari, it talks about um, Muhammad will kind of have, a, have an opportunity for intercession of like basically he, he can make a request and God and Allah will grant it. And that anybody, I think it says, who has even said the shahada, even if they don't have, I don't know if it, it, it adds a qualifier, but basically mm-hmm. uh, the implication, I think, is that even if they don't have works, even if they haven't lived a good Muslim life yeah. or whatever, or done the prayers, yeah. but if they, they've even said the shahada, that they'll make it to paradise. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So Exactly. Yeah. So ultimately, in the end, uh, y- you know, faith itself uh, would even save you know those unfortunate Muslim souls who went to hell and but that's not to make like light of it in any way because we wouldn't want to be in hellfire even for a second right yeah. right I think I think there would be the pushback might be to say maybe there's misunder- some misunderstanding of the Christian position and maybe that's in part by Christians explaining it but mm. um, it, 
like it's not that we're saying they're like there's there's a common statement that actually I think is helpful that that I think it goes um, we are safe on the basis of faith alone but faith is never alone yeah. right like if it's genuine faith it which goes to James's itself. point yeah. the type of faith mm -hmm. that results in salvation is a working faith right right mm -hmm. So if it doesn't work, then it's dead. It's not living, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, okay. So, all right. Uh, I'm, I mean, maybe there could be more discussion about it, but... Uh, yeah. I but yeah, just in general, yeah, this misunderstanding sure. that, you know, you have to earn your way to salvation and God in Islam is kind of like some accountant who's just kind of balancing what about, everything. Uh, what about uh, Allah is not a loving God, right? Isn't that, that what often is said yeah, by Christians? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of his names in the Quran is Al-Wadud, which means okay. the loving, right? Right? Okay. Or the source of love, you know, or the most loving. So he absolutely is. He's not an impersonal God. He's not an abstract uh, God of the philosophers who is not concerned. Uh, or as I put it, like, um, even though we don't use the father analogy, but sometimes I just throw out there, you know, the absent parent, the deadbeat dad. No, I mean, yeah. God in Islam obviously is concerned with his creation, which is why he sends prophet after right. prophet. And he sends guidance. Yeah, I've benefit. actually, that point, the last point about sending... It, he doesn't. He doesn't send the prophets from an Islamic perspective. He's not sending the prophets because they deserve it, right? It's mm. big, like he's he's sending them as a warning, which is a, which is an act of compassion, right? Uh, right, right, exactly. Oh, by the way, e even on a, if we can apply logic to such things, okay. um, e even just on a logical level, um, of, of it's it's always God's grace and His mercy because. Um, if let's say God rewarded me with a never-ending paradise, an infinite, because Muslims believe mm -hmm. paradise never ends. Okay, so if he's re if he's rewarding me, inshallah, with this infinite paradise, what is he rewarding me for? A, a short seventy years uh, of good works that I did, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so it would be more fitting if I lived up until age 70, I lived as a good Muslim, God should say, okay, now I'll reward you with 70 years in paradise. And that's it. Okay. 70 years in paradise, then you will cease to exist. Okay. Why a never-ending paradise? So even that is an expression or a manifestation of God's mercy. Well, it's the, like, it's multiplying it, right? So right. like you have a few, I think it's, I don't remember where it says in the Quran, but like there's, there's this talks about essentially, I think it weighing good deeds as 10 times as much as they would normally weigh. Right, right. Um, so that's almost like, it's like grading on a curve, yes, would you say? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that fair? Yeah, okay. so, right. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, hey, I, I wanted to ask this question, maybe it's a bit of a funny question, is uh, lots of Christians have told me you weren't allowed to be my friend. <laughs> right. Is right. that right? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm just saying right, but it's, it's, no, it's completely not right. And I, Where does it come I, from? I, yeah. Uh, well, there are, um, there are verses in the Quran, which when you read in the English translation, you know, it'll say like, you know, do not be friends with the disbelievers. But even those verses, like for example, um, in chapter 3, verse 28 is one example. If you, if you read the whole thing, a couple of those verses go on to say that do not... Uh, befriend the disbelievers like in preference to the believers okay. or beside the believers. So that is there. That's definitely there, right? Um, then there's a couple of other instances which don't have that disclaimer of like in preference to the believers. But when you look at all of the commentaries, and we were talking about the, the scholarly tradition of Sunni Islam before we started the podcast, you know, mm -hmm. I do make uh, reference and recourse to that tradition. We look at what scholars and great commentators on the Quran said, and the commentators will usually say that this is talking about the besieged Muslims in the city of Medina, who were some of whom or some of the hypocrite Muslims were making secret alliances with the Jewish tribes for protection yep. so that in case the pagan Arabs from Mecca were to overtake Medina tomorrow, they would have this kind of backup protection, you know, with, with a Jewish clan. So the Quran is saying not to do that, to trust in God and to uh, take as friends your, your fellow believers. Also, the other thing is... Um, in all of these verses, to my memory, the Arabic word that is used is awliya, which, again, it's one of those vast Arabic words, right? It, it means, the, the best translation would be protecting friends. Protecting friends. Okay. So do not take non-Muslims as protecting friends in preference to 
the believers. So that's hmm. the first part of your question as to where sure. the misunderstanding stems okay. from. Yeah. yeah. And and again, in in uh, in the post 9-11, mm-hmm. these Clear Quran were... Clear translates it as guardians. As guardians, Very which would be a better, which would be a better translation. Saying. Exactly, yeah. Um, but post 9-11, which we were talking about earlier on, these kinds of verses were sometimes put up in isolation, like on TV screens, right? On news mm-hmm. reports. Um, so yeah, people would walk away with that misunderstanding that you just cannot, uh, a Muslim just cannot be f- uh, friends with a non-Muslim mm-hmm. period, period. And, and that's not correct. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I wonder if, would you be, okay, so I, I want to kind of come back. We talked about double standards about Christians doing it. Mm-hmm. We, we were going to flip it around. Mm-hmm. Um, are there actually, before we talk about double standards, um, on that you might be able to identify on the Muslim side. Well, were we done with the friends thing, by the way? Yeah, we're coming back to that. Yeah, I thought that was at a. Okay, but you no, want to add on more? Yeah, that? I, yeah, I thought okay, that was sorry. the first part of your question. So oh, if no, no, I may, no. okay, I'm sorry yeah. about no, that. No, no, yeah, yeah. Ahead. Well, Please. well, uh, w- what's really interesting, right? Is um, sorry, yeah. Um, in uh, chapter five, verse five, okay. in the Quran, uh, it says in the English translation says, uh, "This day, all good things are made lawful for you." The food of those who have been given the book is lawful for you, and your food is lawful for them. And likewise, the chaste women of the believers, here's the part, and the chaste women of those who were given the book before you, when you have given them their dowry as married women, not as fornicators. So the summary of that is um, that, again, all across the board, the Muslim commentators, the four schools of thought, they all understand this verse to mean that a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman or a Jewish woman without her even converting to Islam. And that's a valid marriage in the Sharia. So the Christian who says you can't be my friend would have to say that you, you can't be friends with your wife. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, or they would have to redefine what the word friend means. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. What does friend mean? Does right. friend mean we sit together, we laugh, uh, I trust you, we eat together, we can hang out, um, uh, like, like you would have to redefine friend, right? So mm-hmm. if friend means all of these things that I said, how are you going to be married to a woman and not joke with her, not have loving relations with her? Uh, uh, not, so it just doesn't make sense that the Quran would say that I can marry a Jewish woman. Uh, by the way, she can remain Jewish her entire life. The Christian woman, like it, it's, not a, it's not some kind of understanding that at some point she has to convert to Islam. Right. I could marry a Christian woman and in theory she could remain Christian her entire life. Right. That is a valid marriage according to the Sharia. Yeah. Yeah. No one in the mosque could point their finger at me and say, Sadat, what a hypocrite. Because look, you know, he's, talking, he's debating Christians on the one hand, but he's got a Christian wife. No, no, no. It, it's, it's, it's valid. It's allowed. Um, so yeah, it just doesn't make sense that the Quran would say, I can laugh with my Christian wife. Uh, you know, we share the marriage bed, we raise children together. Uh, if she's sick, guess what? I have to take care of her. If I'm sick, I, I, she's taking care of me. Mm-hmm. I trust her. She's cooking for me every day. Um, she's not poisoning me. I'm not poisoning her. I make tea for mm-hmm. her, right? Um, we can do all of that. But we can't be friends, though. Right. But we can't be friends, though. No, that, that, that just wouldn't make sense at all, right? Yeah. Um, and then another uh, very relevant verse is in chapter 28, verse 56. Right, 2856, in that, and I'll, I'll read it for the Muslims as well. Yeah. God says to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you cannot guide those that you love. But it is, gui- it is God who guides whomever he wishes. Mm-hmm. So the point there being that it means the Prophet must have loved some people who were not Muslim. Because God is saying you cannot guide those ones that you love. And most of the commentators say this is in reference to his uncle Abu Talib, who never formally this accepted is, Islam. Th- th- so to understand, so this is like ultimate guidance, right? Not like I can't help them. Yeah, as we were like, speaking about earlier on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ul- ult- ultimately. Like whether they're going to believe in how they're Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah th- right. that, that conviction in the heart or however you sure. want to put it, ultimately is going to come from God. But the main point I'm drawing your attention to there is that there was someone that the Prophet loved. And right. God is reminding him, look, don't fret over it. Don't get frustrated over it. You can't guide right. everyone that you love. You know. Um, yeah. Last time I brought this up, then some Muslim emailed me and said, you didn't list all of the conditions. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not a scholar and we're not teaching Islamic law. But sure. just on a side note, I mean, the Muslim scholars make some distinctions between, I think, 
like a rational love or a natural love. And so a natural love that you have for your family, for your kin, for anyone that has done good to you, mm-hmm. um, that natural love, you know, that, that can't be helped. So it's not like if someone converts to Islam, we say, now you can't love your mother anymore. <laughs> Now you can't love your dad anymore. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Islam never requires you to do something that is unnatural in that mm-hmm. way. Yeah. And, and for me, I don't have non-Muslim family, that I, not that I can think of, but uh, I mean, you know, one of my best friends, uh, I've, I've uh, known him since he was three years old. He's a Sikh. Mm-hmm. He's three, we, knew, we knew each other since we were three years old. And we still hang out now. We still play tennis now. So um, it would be impossible for me to not have uh, affection and, and love for yeah. a friend like that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Do you want to ask number eight? Sure. Yeah, this is a good question. What do you think about Christians who are willing to criticize other Christians publicly? And also, what do you think about Muslims who are, or what do you think about Muslims critiquing other mu- Muslims publicly? Yeah, um, well, Christians uh, critiquing other Christians, but I think that's a great idea, man. <laughs> I mean, I want to see you do more of that. You know, uh, I plan Greg, to. Yeah, I I'm looking to forward actually. to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, honestly, like, like no comments uh, on the Christians criticizing other yeah, Christians yeah, sure. publicly. But I mean, Muslims criticizing other Muslims. I think if you're at their same level, uh, you know, like I mean, so. If Sheikh Yasser Qadi, uh, you know, makes some kind of slip or mistake, like, uh, am I really the uh, correct person to to correct him? I mean, or should it be fellow scholars that should do that? So generally, um, generally what is taught is that you try to advise people in private first. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Before publicly attacking people or canceling them, you should try to advise people in private first. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, and if, especially if their sin was a public sin or they made some uh, wrong misleading statement or a false statement in public, then you can correct that in public, you know. But, uh, but it should be, I think it should be corrected by people who are of the same caliber. You might disagree on that, but that, that's, that's how I so see how, it. So how does that play in a role for you? So you, you got a YouTube channel. Yeah, are, you, it, are you able to talk about other Muslims well, then if you don't think you're on, if you're not formally trained and they are or whatever? Yeah, well, well if you notice, um, if, if you sift through my videos, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be able to say that I've never publicly attacked another, uh, okay. another religious Sunni Muslim. And I'm, I'm making those disclaimers there because, sure. yeah, there are some people who call themselves Muslims who are like really way far out in left field, mm-hmm. you know, uh, really far out in left field that I, I would uh, and I will publicly uh, critique. But um, just, you know, like Sunni scholars or, or religious Sunni Muslims, I've, I've, I, I don't believe I've ever attacked publicly. Um, and, I, and I'm glad because, and, and you know, nowadays it's an easy way to get a lot of views. Like I, all I have to do is make some video attacking Yasser Qadi and that's 20,000, 30,000 views guaranteed like that. But uh, that, that's not the point. That's not what we should mm. be chasing. And, um, and I don't think I'm the person of his caliber to be uh, correcting him or advising him. So Leave that to, to fellow you scholars. You make a to really do. interesting point that I wasn't expecting. So mm. because, so to start off, Christians, um, Christians have this kind of debate too, because right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there is sort of debate and, and disagreement in the Muslim community to what extent you can do that, especially like on YouTube or whatever. Um, and Christians do that too, um, where often what they'll do is they'll cite a passage from Matthew chapter 18 that says, you know, if a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, like to himself privately, right. just okay. one-on-one. Yeah. So that goes to your point about okay. private first. Mm. And then if he doesn't listen, then bring another. And then if he doesn't listen to them, then bring it to the church. So then it's like a big, but but actually this is, so this is about a brother sinning, uh, another believer sinning against. So you do it privately first, but the issue is that when I think Christians uh, misrepresent this passage when they're trying to say, that this applies to social media, uh, you have to, like, I mean, somebody who, or even just a sermon, like if somebody, if Joel Osteen, who I don't consider a, a true Christian, right, like a false teacher, puts out a, a, a sermon, I don't know him personally, I have no way of reaching him, hmm. like, realistically, but he's putting it out in public, right, meaning he's, he's putting it online, so do I have no right to be able to issue a public video that interacts with it? Right. And I think obviously, yes, I can. Um, I don't think the Bible forbids against that. And even if he wasn't a false teacher, if it was just somebody who 
even like a solid person, but they're saying something that's very misleading or very incorrect or whatever mm. it might be. It doesn't have mm. to be a sin. Mm. It could be about a teaching thing. I do think that if somebody puts it in the public realm, it is open to public scrutiny, right? And then, so, cause on the flip side, if you say, well, I put it out on the public, but you can't scrutinize it. Mm. And sorry, I'm not gonna message you back. <laughs> like, then you're basically say, like you're safe from any scrutiny. And, mm. and it really the people that should be scrutinizing I'll speak from from the Christian community. The people who should be really scrutinizing the Christians who are speaking publicly are other Christians, mm. first and foremost, right? So I would think the principle would apply. But the thing that you raised that I wasn't expecting, I was expecting all of that sort of thing from a Muslim perspective. But what you said is sort of like critiquing somebody if you're sort of of their caliber or on their level or however you want to put it. Because I do think that, yeah, it does make sense if you say just some random person who's not let's say not just about not formally trained i mean you could have training when they're going to a seminary to some extent um like you have street training uh, as just one for instance right that a lot of other people don't have that so it does give you some credibility or some knowledge base to be able to speak from uh, to an issue but i do think yes some random people on tiktok you know, critiquing a sermon or a whatever might be a statement that, yeah, that, mm. that does seem kind of seem to be out of place. Mm. It should be the ones, uh, pastors, leaders, teachers, theologians, apologists, philosophers from the Christian community who are critiquing, let's say, other pastors, other theologians, etc. first and foremost. And I would say it doesn't leave it. It doesn't mean somebody else can't. But I think to the principle, I think is that's a pretty good one and, like and i'm that. surprised by what you said right now because um i thought you know you're not big on the hierarchical thing I, I i didn't expect you to agree but um yeah that that's how i view it i would prefer that someone on their caliber or at uh, least do at first. least do it yeah. with humility yeah yeah exactly right like well that's the other thing if you are going to publicly scrutinize then do it to the extent necessary i think right and, and we already agreed to not attack the character and uh to, to not get nasty yeah we're, that we're not even talking about that we're yeah. just talking about arguments and stuff, yeah right? so i think for muslims yeah. it's very important to not start uh questioning other people's faith just question them on that issue and, and try to correct them on that issue but as far as i go look I, i'm I'm just concerned about avoiding blunders myself when I make videos, to be quite honest with you, and to just kind of stick to uh, general things that, that I, I, I know about. Yeah. Okay, well, and in, in maybe relating to that a little bit is uh, we, we were talking about, maybe we would talk about Hadith. Yeah. Um, so, and you can kind of say, you can move on or whatever to, if you want, but I have noticed that the more I talk and interact with the Muslim community, Sunni in particular, um, I'm finding there it seems like there's an uptick or a increasing number of uh, Muslims who express to me their I don't know what the right way of phrasing it lack of confidence in the Hadith or willingness to critique uh, Hadith that might be included in a collection like Bukhari that would be classified as Sahih um, that maybe previously people weren't really open to critiquing um, it seems like I, I've noticed like Shabir Ali has like very prominent voice in Canada online and he's he's got a whole series on Hadith and seems to be embracing a openness to reassess Hadith almost wholesale and maybe I'm going too far in my way of representing it but can you speak to that phenomena is that just something that I'm noticing or is that something you're noticing as well? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's an uptick. Like, okay. it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's it's hard to measure that. I, these movements have been around for you know the past century, 150 years. You know, post-colonialism, that's been there because there were efforts to modernize Islam, and modernizing Islam is going to be harder with when you have the you know all these collections of hadiths because there's going to be many things in there that are going to contradict. Uh, liberal ideas and politically correct ideas and feminism mm -hmm. and so forth so i know uh, i don't have that much to say about this other than um i mean i went through kind of an anti-hadith phase myself uh, in the past i went through a quran only kind of phase myself mm -hmm. and i know that for me it, it it wasn't driven by anything academic it's not like i was questioning the narrators or the chains it was just uh simply that i thought 
I'll have an easier time if I don't have to deal with some of these hadiths, okay. right? So, for example, you have a, a hadith in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that had God instructed human beings to prostrate, to prostrate down mm -hmm. to anyone other than God, it would have been to the woman to prostrate to her husband. Because a husband is supposed to be doing so much, you know, for the wife in terms of being her guardian and protecting her, providing for her and so forth. So, I mean, that runs very contrary to modern, like, feminist principles and ideas of gender equality and stuff like that. So it becomes an easy way uh, to be dismissive and say, well, these hadiths, we right. don't know, hey, uh, who collected them and is it really authentic? Did the Prophet really say it? So uh, all I'll say is that... Um, you know, within the realm of scholarship, there's also some debate. There's always been some debate about uh, um, certain hadiths. And again, that's really best left to the scholars. But, okay. for, but for the layperson who doesn't know much about Islam and says, well, I don't believe that hadith. I, I, it's, often, it's often a very whimsical thing. It's really just based on their personal pr liberal prejudices. And, and oftentimes, those Muslims who say that, are often irreligious and haven't even studied or read much of the Quran. Because if they did, they would realize that they would run into the same kinds of problems, right? So if you have a problem with jinn stories in the hadiths, well, what about jinn stories in the Quran? Right. What about the very opening of chapter 2 where it says, this is for those who believe in the unseen. Mm -hmm. What about the Prophet Solomon or King Solomon talking to the animals and, uh, and understanding the speech of the animals? This is in the Quran, right? Right. So, Not um, in the Bible, but it's in the Quran. Yeah, it's in the, Quran, it's in the Quran. So the point being uh, that sometimes people dismiss certain things in hadiths because it seems a little bit uh, far-fetched or this is going to be a hard sell. Okay, I need know, a follow-up then. So I can appreciate sort of like, well, I don't maybe not going too into the weeds with it, but for then the average Muslim who isn't trained, how do you make sense of um, some trained Muslims like Shabir Ali, who's giving opinions that might be less, I don't know, less, less traditional, more modern. And whereas the other Imam that you're at your masjid is, is more traditional. So how do you weigh that out if you're, if you're not coming from a position of knowledge and ability to evaluate you're hearing two different opinions yeah well actually traditional trained imams would not be doing this kind of wholesale you know revamp of the hadiths uh, like shabir ali is doing so w with respect to him actually he, he's not an example of a trained imam right so okay. he, yeah yeah with respect to him and he's a very no knowledgeable intelligent person i've learned a lot from him but um he's not attended any kind of formal Islamic training. He hasn't attended any traditional religious seminary or right. anything like that. He went to U of T. He did T, go I to think. U of T. Yeah, yeah. Right, but it's not a like it's a, not traditional a traditional Islamic. Exactly. Okay, I see yeah, yeah, yeah. So by his own admission, he's not. Uh, this is not something he's trained in. He's self-taught, and this tendency is usually from the self-taught people. Right. There's a huh. there's a gentleman in Pakistan or from Pakistan, Javed Ghamidi, who's of a, of a similar kind of bent. Okay. Um, there was a guy in Arizona, an Egyptian American in Arizona, I think, named Rashid Khalifa, who really uh, pushed for this Quran only thing back in the. There's back a guy. In the I forget 80s. his name. There's a guy on your line. He has a lot of. I think he's got a fairly big following in the states, and he, I think he left Pakistan, and uh, he's kind of. I think he's more Quran only. I don't know if that's the right way. It, of it might be Javed Ramadi or Muhammad no, no, no. Sheikh. No. But, but again, the, the, the common denominator between them is that they're not traditionally trained. Yeah, yeah they're not. They're not traditionally trained. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Daniel, you want to ask a question that you were thinking of asking? Sure. This, is, this has to do with Islamophobia. Yeah. And this is, um, and I, as we've discussed already, is that you actually don't like the term and it's something that, um, first off, to say is that we definitely acknowledge that there are anti-Islamic acts that happen here in Canada mm. and, and abroad. And that's not certain, certainly something that we don't deny. Mm. But this terminology that's being used, with, especially within Canada, and using the term Islamophobia, and we would equate it very similar to when we hear terms like transphobic mm. or homophobic, and when... Christians and Muslims are category are lumped into these categories when that's you know maybe we don't agree 
with their community, maybe our fundamental beliefs are conflicting with theirs, but we're certainly not phobic. That's certainly not the case. And this language that's being used is very Marxist in nature. It comes like the critical theorists use it. And so what's, what's a bit frustrating about the Islamophobia, especially like our prime minister uses it a lot for things that happen within Canada. And what's frustrating about this is it seems what it would appear is that using the term is sort of like utilizing Marxist tactics mm. to sort of gain maybe favor in public opinion or within the House of Commons and things like that. So I'm not exactly sure if I have a question exactly around it, but I'm, I would really like to hear your take on the use of the term. And um, I'm also curious if you're, if you're aware of the sort of like Marxist tendencies behind using the phobia language it's sort of a weaponized language yeah, yeah. i'd love to hear your uh, your take on it yeah I, I also became i might not have thought about it in as much depth as you but i know that i also became a bit uncomfortable with the t with the use or the overuse of the word you know islamophobia like for two reasons one is yes i noted i, I noted that th there's this analogy to you know transphobia and homophobia and the, right um so uh, and and that kind of just subconsciously makes young people believe that well if you're opposed to this phobia then you should be opposed to that phobia too right mm. uh, it, it comes as a package so you're supposed to be um, opposed to Islamophobia but then also uh, also opposed to what they're calling homophobia and transphobia so I think there's a subconscious kind of like programming that's going on there's something there that I'm uncomfortable about with that uh, so you're right it has those Marxist kind of connotations but then the other thing is um, I, I feel that sometimes it may have been overused as well um, and you don't want to kind of you know just overplay that card so I, I don't believe every time somebody looks f uh, looks at me funny on the street okay there's another instance of Islamophobia right, right? so we um, the bottom line is really if there's a word that we're uncomfortable with if it's if it's rather than facilitating commun effective communication if it's actually becoming a stumbling block between us then let's take that word let's throw it out the window you know mm. and let's just keep it to yeah anti-muslim or anti-islamic you know sentiment and even then things need to be defined right? i was just gonna say yeah that, be, be, because even then that, even then? then you will have some islamic uh, views and i don't consider that to be hateful or illegal <laughs> you know i don't have a problem with you having those anti-islamic views i mean if you don't believe that the prophet muhammad peace be upon him is a prophet of god well that that is in a way an anti-islam anti view isn't it right um well we would say the bible uses the language of anti-christ right. which isn't just about like a final figure it's it's about talks about the spirit of antichrist in first john four just to say anything that differs on the doctrine about mm. christ coming in the flesh the divine son of god right, right so i would say well yeah but that doesn't mean it's about there's a there's a disagreement i think yeah. there's a difference between disagreeing and hating right right a big right, difference right right right, right. So uh, that, that's exactly it. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I have some anti-Christian beliefs or you know, not yeah. anti, but un-Christian beliefs. But uh, if that was called Christ Christianophobia or Christophobia, <laughs> right. uh, that somehow implies that, you know, I'm, I'm out to commit hate crimes and vandalize a church or something. Right. It can be a bit misleading at times. So I think that that term Islamophobia might be a bit problematic. Yet at the same time, after 9-11, they needed some term to kind of encapsulate or you know describe what's going on so I, I understand it but maybe it had had a limited usage maybe it's outlived its purpose but the main point is uh, really that um, anti-muslim hateful sentiment uh, and anti-muslim violent sentiment that still does exist uh, although yes. I think it's gotten maybe it's gotten better in, in the West uh, but um, uh, but I think, yeah, let's just deal with the actual problem and, and not worry too much about the labels. But but yeah, just as far as I'm concerned, as I said, you ha like even anti-Islamic sentiment has to be defined. What exactly are we talking about? You know, right. if it's promoting some kind of hatred or violent sentiment that we should all well, as Canadians, yeah. we should condemn that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But um, if it's just disagreement, then I mean, uh, we have to live uh, with that. We got two more questions, I think. So one, one is uh, I really appreciate that. By yeah, the way. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Man. So actually kind of related to it because I think, um, so my question is, do you think it would be good for Christians and Muslims to come together more? If so, in what ways? And maybe where are the limits? But that question I think relates to what we're talking about with Islamophobia because I found the more that I try to bring Muslims and Christians together, like for 
political we i like the word co-belligerence like we're 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 kind of fighting alongside each other doesn't mean we're all on the same side with everything we have different significant differences on lots of things but we can work alongside each other on some limited goals and so on but i find the more that i try to invite others to be part of that and i hear muslims they often use the language of islamophobia and stuff i know that that is going to immediately push away um especially evangelical christians who do see that as like a marxist term and see think do believe that that's being misused and so on um, and so I think that kind of becomes a barrier f uh, in our discourse mm -hmm. uh, when we're coming from different communities, we're hearing things differently. Um, so, but coming to this question though, do you think it would be good for Christians and Muslims to come together more? If so, in what ways? Yeah, so I mean, w w one of the negatives that also happened after 9-11 was like just that kind of breakdown in the, I think, Muslim-Christian relations, I think, right, I, right. I think in America. And I mean, most Muslims had actually voted for George Bush Jr., you know? I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most Muslims at that time were quite a conservative uh, community and, and, and were voting Republican. Uh, but what happened was I, I kind of give an analogy, right? Um, of a school cafeteria and you imagine in the school cafeteria uh, I'm, I'm a high school kid let's say um, and nobody wants to be my friend in this cafeteria now I hope I won't hurt anyone uh, offend anybody's uh, sensibilities here I'm not trying to pick on anybody but the only person in that cafeteria that wants to be friends with me is the guy with green hair who's got rings in his nose who smokes weed who's got tattoos of dragons on his neck that's the only guy in the cafeteria who wants to be my friend He's the only guy that's going to let me sit with him at the lunchroom uh, table, right? Okay. Well, he's going to be my friend. So on a community level, this is kind of what happened with Muslims post 9-11. Is like we, we completely fell in with the left-wing liberal crowd, not because our religion is uh, liberal in that way when it comes to sexuality or, or right. homosexuality, let's say, uh, but because really they were the only people that wanted to be our friends, right? The, the, the evangelical pastors at that time in America didn't really want to be our friends. It, right. it seemed like that to us. So yes, to answer your question, I hope that we can uh, cooperate much more now on social issues. We should be able to identify that there's many social issues and family values that we have in common. Mm -hmm. And and I'll just say it like I mean the transgender issue in the in the public schools uh, for young kids and all these things. Um, really, we should put some of our differences aside for the moment and say, look, uh, our our children are th like this is really important, yeah. you know, to, to to try to protect them from this. And not everybody's able to homeschool or put their kids in a religious education. So uh, these are some issues where I think you know uh, I think Muslims have done well and have in some cases even led the way even though we're, we're you know, two percent of Canada, right? Um, so yeah, absolutely, there, there's a lot more that we can uh, work together on. Yeah. Uh, maybe Daniel, you wanna ask 11 that can kind of conclude us? Sure, so if, if a non-Muslim wants to learn about Islam, read the Quran, Islamic texts, learn how to handle the sources or the best way to learn what you truly believe what what advice would you give to them what what direction would you point them in yeah um well i mean starting on the mo most basic level um it depends where they're starting at so yeah i'm, I'm kind of assuming at the most basic level um say nothing basically. yeah say they know yeah. nothing well I, I i still really do like it has its shortcomings of course but the translation of the quran by yusuf ali with the footnotes <laughs> with the footnotes, um, which is almost kind of like a mini commentary, you know, you call it a commentary, yeah, yeah, yeah. but so the, like a study Quran. yeah, like exactly. A study Quran. Yeah. And then there's also a translation of the Quran called the study Quran. Okay. Yep. And again, I have to make the disclaimer. I don't agree with like, w yeah. as with any man written book, we would do the same thing. Yeah. With the yeah. Bible, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Exactly. With yeah. That, with really. any human written uh, work, you know, there's going to be shortcomings, but the study Quran is very good because it tells you what, a lot of traditional commentators said about those verses and so if there's okay. something unclear in the translation right uh it's it's very good so i would say the english translation by yusuf ali with the footnotes or the the study quran it's called the study quran right mm -hmm. there's only one um there's also a great lecture there's a couple of great lectures on youtube by hamza yusuf um one of them is called the articles of faith 
So in YouTube search, basically, you'd have to type in Hamza Yusuf, Articles of Faith. Mm -hmm. and I'll the, find a way to put yeah, it on the screen. And too. the other one is Hamza Yusuf, Pillars of Islam. Mm -hmm. And this was actually like a course uh, that he gave for non-Muslims. Right. Yeah, so this is completely for people who are like, you know, very new to it. Um, and there's a there's a film called The Message, a 1977 film called The Message, which is based on the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Like it gives you just a basic timeline okay. of his life, and that's in English. It's called The Message, a 1977 okay. film. So these would be some good initial resources to familiarize yourself with Islam a bit more before doing a, a deeper dive. You know. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. You didn't ask me about double standards that Muslims had when we talk about. Oh, I didn't come back to that. I'm helping okay. you out. All right. I helped you out with that one. <laughs> yeah, no, please do share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. we have no double standards, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, it. That's yeah, yeah. my answer, yeah. No, um, you know, there are a couple of things that just like you feel frustrated when you see Christians yeah, bring, no. let's say, really bad arguments against Islam. Sure. Even, even you recognize, okay, that's a bad argument against Islam. It frustrates yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. So likewise, um, my view is like disagree with Christianity for the right reasons, not for something that uh, is is a you know a, a very kind of wrong like reason. Like we or believe the moon god or something. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. I've got the moon god equivalent here. Okay. Okay. Psalm 18, and this is not theoretical. This is not hypothetical. I've seen a young Muslim make this okay. point in front of a crowd in a debate. He quoted Psalm 18. He says, "The Lord is my rock." There you have it, man. You worship <laughs> a rock. <laughs> okay. The Lord is my rock, right? So if God is your rock, then 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 God. God so uh, I actually like corrected that Muslim. Like you know, I right. even I even 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 publicly, I put up my hand. I said this is just not fair. I think I used the moon god uh, example, and I said when they say we worship a moon god, how do we feel? Well, this is how Christians in the audience would be feeling right now when you right. say uh, that Christians worship a rock. Of course, the point is this is like figurative language. Yeah, no, I get, I of right, yeah. Um, and then I've seen many Christian, uh, many Muslims quote uh, Luke uh, chapter 19, verse 27. In their defense, I really believe that most of them are doing this out of ignorance. I, I don't believe they're purposely trying to misrepresent uh, Jesus in the Bible here. But in Luke 19, uh, verse 27, they say that Jesus said, But those enemies of mine who did not want, to be, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Mm -hmm. There you go. See how violent Jesus was? He actually yeah. said, like, in other words, those Romans and those centurions and yeah. stuff who don't believe in him, bring them, kidnap them, bring them here somehow so we can kill them right here. Now, of course, the context is that Jesus was giving a parable. Right. And this was, uh, this was the king in that parable who was speaking. I still think that can raise some questions for discussion, like why did Jesus use a violent analogy or why did he liken himself to that violent king? I I'm just saying, I think there's some room for discussion. But to put it that bluntly that oh here jesus said bring his enemies there and kill them in front of him well, i don't if, believe if that we're that's talking about too. god too like in, in god as judge right right that that language is kind of used a lot in all throughout the bible old and new testament yeah it could be right? a foreshadowing of jesus's role in the future in the book of revelation maybe or something like this which but, does use that kind of language yeah. right? but yeah. the point is to say that jesus advocated for violence in first century Palestine and to yeah, kill his enemies clearly there. Doesn't mean, it's it's yeah. very unfair. And um, so when, when Muslims uh, make those kinds of arguments, I say, look, if you're going to debate, if you're going to disagree with Christians or the Bible, like do it for better reasons. That's okay. not about, that's not proper. Yeah. So it's good. All right. Well, thank thank you for saving me and and, <laughs> and sharing. <laughs> I thought it would be fair. It would only be fair. Yeah. So. No, well, thank you, Sadat. Thank you. We thank really you so appreciate much. your time, Sadat, and uh, your friendship and uh, learning from each other. Thank so you. hope there'll be more opportunity. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks yes. for your help. Thanks thank for you, Sadat. I learned a lot today. Thanks. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. Please share this video if you found this helpful, and remember to like subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to see more like it. Until next time, keep learning, keep loving, and keep sharing until all here.